around the world and here at home, bringing relief, hope, and the life-changing message of Jesus. You're listening to the Mize Missions Podcast with Terry Mize. Welcome, everybody, to our Terry Mize Ministries Podcast. I'm Lynn, and I'm sitting here as usual with Terry and Renee Mize, and we're talking about the things of God. And, Dad, one of the things right off the bat that I wanted to mention was you've been called by a lot of people um, an authority on protection and spiritual authority and things like that. You've traveled the wor- world and you've done missionary um, endeavors and, and meetings and open-air crusades and pastor's conferences, and you've dealt with the orphans and that sort of thing. And we were talking recently on a trip about protection, and one of the easiest things we can do to find out about protection, what uh, God puts in His Word that we can use in our daily lives so that we're protected and we don't have to deal with some of the things that, that other people have to deal with. And we just very simply went to Psalm 91. Sure. As a matter of fact, you took some of your grandkids and began to talk to them for a, a, a period of days about Psalm 91 and taught them how to study the Word and taught them about protection and that sort of right. thing. So I wanted to ask you about that. That's a simple thing to just say, go read Psalm 91. Right. But you were talking to the grandkids because I was I was a fly on the wall in those sure. in those sessions, and you were talking to them about actually taking that. And I know, Renee, you were telling them specifically to put your name in there right. and make it personal. Exactly. And I wanted to ask you about that. How does somebody, somebody who doesn't, you know, they believe in God, they're, they're right. Christians, they love right. the Lord, right. but they don't understand about this protection thing that you're talking about. Right. How do you do that? You know, he, it says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. And you were talking about what that even means to dwell in the secret place of the most high. Right. I had just glanced at a scripture before we went on the, um, to record this. And that is that, and John chapter 5, Jesus chastised the Pharisees and told him, he said, you search the scriptures, you know the scriptures, but you don't know God. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, you know, chastise them about that. And so Psalm 91 is really knowing God in a very personal way, dwelling in the presence of God through the word of God, and then beginning to take the scriptures and praying them and putting, like you said, your name in them, like I dwell in the secret mm-hmm. place of the Most High, and I abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. And then you just think about that. <laughs> what yeah. does that mean? You know that little word people's people just kind of you know float over in the Psalms where it says Selah. Right. And that little word means to pause and calmly think about it. And the and the word meditation means to mutter literally. To think about it. So like at the down at the end of the chapter where it says, I will say of the Lord, uh, you know, where it says, because you have uh, set your love upon me and because of that, you start putting your name in there right. and you make it very personal. So you make the scripture about your personal relationship between you and God. Yeah. Well, you know, Lynn, I, I think that um, there's been such a misconception about the Bible in general right. throughout history. Because, you know, you've always had people believe in the Bible to some degree. Right. And it's kind of the, kind of how many degrees you get into it, <laughs> yeah. uh, how That's well right. it's going to work, you know. That's right. I mean, you get the old cowboy, you know, in the, in the old West. I mean, he believed in God, and he, he knew a scripture or two that his mom had taught him. And right. I remember hearing years ago, of course, I'm a big Western fan and, and reading Louis Lamore books and stuff many, many years ago. Uh, I remember one old cowboy said, well, you know, if you sleep with the Bible under your saddle, it keeps the witches away. Right, right, and and so a lot of people use, right. put, and so a lot of people use the Bible like a lucky charm, like a rabbit's foot, right. like a four leaf clover, have you it know, on like, the coffee like, table, like Aladdin's lamp, so they can rub it and get a genie and get three wishes. Right, but of course that's that's not what the Bible's about, and so so many people that are Christians, I mean, of every denomination, every stripe. Uh, people say, oh, I just I just read Psalm ninety one. Well, I lift not Psalm ninety one. I pray Psalm ninety one. Yeah. And yet, and yet they'll come to me and say, Brother Terry, I was believing Psalms 91 all over the place, and yet we had this horrible thing happen or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and so I've always brought it back. Well, it's, it's not just you reading it. It's not just you right. rubbing it. Like I, I remember when Bibles first started getting, uh, uh, when when publishers first started putting colored covers on them, like red covers, green covers, you know, blue covers. I mean, I had somebody come to me back in, I don't know, 60s or 70s, and they said, 
Brother Jerry, I got a, I got a Bible in every house, ever room in my house. I've got a red Bible and a green Bible and a blue Bible and a white Bible. I got one in, the, in just outside the shower. I can reach my hand outside and touch it. So it's not Aladdin's lamp uh, where you just rub it and get a genie and get to wish it. It's not a, it's not a lucky talisman. It's not a lucky, you know, a lucky rabbit's foot you stick in your shirt pocket. It's not where you can touch it or not. You know, some people have that 35 pound Bible on their coffee table, you know, exactly. and they, they yeah. just, they dust it off religiously and they pat it lovingly, you know, and some people even, you know, light a candle around it or, or, or put, you know, pictures around it or something yeah. like it's a holy shrine. But the Bible is the covenant of Almighty God. That's it's right. the word of Almighty God that this compiled there in the book and it's God's covenant. So, so there's a difference in the way, you know, you take 25 people and say, go read enough Psalms 91 and they might all read it differently because it's the, it's the degree to which they believe what it actually says. So to me, when you say Psalms 91 to me, it's it's a matter of what makes Psalms ninety one work to me. The key phrase is verse two that says, "I, I will, will say, say of the Lord." Lord. That's it. You mean that's, you actually have to say? Yeah, yeah. that's to me. That's how <laughs> I make right. Psalms ninety one work. I don't just read exactly. it. You know, he says, he, "He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty." I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God. You know, my strength, my song, my strong tower, my help, my hope. You know, some trust in horses and some in chariots, but I trust in the name of the Lord my God. That's not Psalm 91. That's my right, edition. Right. But uh, in him will I trust. Surely he delivers me. So to me, verse 2 is the whole key to Psalms 91, right. that if you don't do verse 2, right. then all you're doing is reading uh a great word of God. Right. But you're not you're not taking it, you're not taking the sword out of the sheath. You know, the Bible is, is the, the word says, says that the Bible is the sword. It's our sword. And so whenever Jesus said to the devil those three times, it is written. When Satan came to tempt him uh, three different times, and every time Jesus came back and said, it is written. Yeah. And when he did that, that was like pulling the sword out. Just like, you know, I guess kids today would see a Star Wars, you know, lightsaber. a lightsaber. Where it goes, you know, and, and all of a sudden the word just lights up. Right. And, well, that's and what it, happens in the spirit. Yeah, the, right. the word comes yeah, out it, and the demons flee. Yeah, yeah. It is written. And whenever, whenever you say of the Lord, he's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. Now, who is Jesus to you? I've got a, I've got a teaching series I've done for years called uh, "Who Do You Say Jesus Is?" Right. Because if you call him healer, he'll be healer. If you call him Lord, he'll be Lord. If you call him King, he'll be King. You know, who, whoever you say he is, that's who he'll be to you. Yeah. One of the greatest things I think I ever uh, encountered personally about the ninety first Psalm, and you'll remember this story quite well. In fact, Renee, you'll remember this because you and and Dean were with Jackie and I mm -hmm. in Trinidad when this happened way many decades ago, oh, yes. but we had finished doing an open air crusade. Right. And then we were preaching the last Sunday we were in, in the mm -hmm. country of Trinidad and Tobago. We were in a church and on that Sunday morning I, I had preached and, and prayed for salvation and prayed for sick people. And, and the service was dismissed. It was over. And so uh, I walked on out. I think Dean and Renee, maybe you and Dean walked out with me and we went out on the front porch and we're shaking hands with people as they, came out of the church. Jackie didn't come with us. She stayed right. in the church. And so uh, we shook hands with all these people over and over and over again, you know, and then pretty soon there's no more people coming out. And I thought, well, where, where is Jackie? You know, well, she didn't come out. So I opened the church door and stuck my head in the door to see where Jackie was, where your mom was. And uh, she was standing down at the front of the church, r right by the platform, right in front of the pulpit. And she was looking over to the side of the church. So I followed her gaze to see what is she looking at? And over there on the side of the church in the corner was about 15 or 20 Christians trying to cast a devil out of a little old girl. I couldn't tell who they're trying to cast it out of, but I could tell they're trying to cast a devil out of somebody. And I mean, arms were flailing and hands were flailing and legs were flailing and, you know, and screaming and carrying on what's going on. And, and, uh, and I look back at mom and she just standing there watching these people. And so I, I said quietly, so as not to disturb, I said, Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. So she looked up and heard me, and I, and I said, uh, I said, come on, let's go, let's go. And I motioned to her, let's go. And she shook her head, no. And she she motioned me, come here. And she said, Terry, come here. And I and I said, no, let's go. And I shook my head, no, you know. And she said, no, come here. And she motioned me to come here. And so I pointed at my watch real dramatically, like, you know, it's, it's late. I pointed at my stomach, like I'm hungry, <laughs> you know, and I pointed sure. at my mouth. And I said, let's go. And she shook her head, no. And she said, come here. So I got real tough. You know how we are in the South. If you're serious, you use both <laughs> names, you know. So I said, Jackie Noel, let's go. And so she got real serious and she said, Terry Lynn, come here. 
Now, I don't know why I even started that argument. I know I'm not going to win it. Right. I don't know why I bothered. Right. <laughs> but so I marched off down there to the plot to the deal. And I said, what is it you want? What do you want? And she said, I want you to go rescue this girl before these Christians kill her. Hmm. And so I looked over there and there's that pile of people just flailing arms and hands and legs and eyes and hair balls, hair and teeth and everything else. Okay. And, uh, and so I went over there and I literally started pulling Christians off this girl. I started grabbing collars and necks and, and just pulled, piling people off this dog pile. That's right. And I got down to the bottom of the pile and there was an 18 year old girl. She was almost nude. They had just about between, between the demons in her and between yeah. the Christians trying to help her, they, they had her, had her blouse off. They had her clothes. I mean, she was almost naked. And, uh, so, uh, and she looked terrible. I mean, she looked demon possessed. She had hair and snot you know, and, and tears running down her face and her hair's plastered to her face. And I just reached down and gra pick, grabbed her by the arms and picked her up and grabbed some of her clothes that was laying there and just kind of draped them around her shoulders and brought them around to the front and then, and then held her real tight. And, and then I just put, grabbed her and put my arms around her in a bear hug mm -hmm. and just cast the devils out of her. And I mean, immediately she was delivered. And so I walked her over and set her on the front oh, seat okay. And uh, led her to Jesus, got her saved, and got her filled with the Holy Ghost. So she got delivered, she got set free from yeah, demons, she got God. saved, she got filled with the Holy Ghost all at the same time. And I, I, I had reached up and wiped the snot and the hair and the you know tears and out of her face and everything. And and after we got done with all that, she told me the most incredible story that I think I've ever ever heard about the Word of God and about deliverance and about Psalms ninety one. Yeah. She said uh, she said Brother Terry, she said I have been uh, demon possessed now. Since I was a little girl, so many people that are demon possessed know they're demon possessed. I was going to say she knew it. She knew it. They know they are. Many of them know it, and they know when it happened. They know where it happened. There's just nothing they can do about it. They don't know how to get loose. And so uh, she told me she'd been demon possessed since she was a little girl. She told me that she had been living with a guy since she was 13. Now this girl's not a Christian before no, no, this. You no. got her saved that. I night. got her saved that that morning, that Sunday morning, and uh, and she's 18, and she's been living with this guy now since she's 13. Yeah. And she has six children because she had had like two sets of twins. So here, this little eighteen-year-old girl has got six children and living with this guy for all these years. And she uh, she said, "Brother Terry, every night the devil walks into my house." And I knew when she said it, she was telling me the truth. You know, a lot of witchcraft and voodoo going on in Trinidad, yeah. and I dealt a lot, a lot with it when I was there that week. And, uh, you know, Trinidad is one of those places you can be standing there talking to somebody and all of a sudden a rock will come out from behind their head and come straight at you and you have to dodge yeah. the rock because it's just supernatural, demonic things going on. But she said, the devil comes in my house every night, every night around midnight. And she said, it just gets cold and clammy in my house. And I, and I thought, yeah, I know. I, I recognize that rascal. Yeah. I've had him walk in. I feel that same feeling. And she said, when he does, she says, the, the, the pictures on the walls begin to vibrate and shake and then come off the come off the wall and float in the air. Mm. She said the drawers that have the silverware in them in the kitchen begin to rattle and shake and shake and rattle and then open and the silverware floats out. And she said, and the kids begin to scream and cry. Now as a mother, as an 18 year old mom, all she cared about was the fact that her kids were screaming and crying. Yeah. She didn't care about the devil. She didn't yeah. care about that other stuff. That was her priority. She's telling me that this happens to me every night yeah. and my kids are screaming and crying and can't go to sleep. And she said, so every night I have to go get my grandmother's, Bible. Hmm. And I said, your, your grandma believed in God. She said, yes, she went to the Methodist church and she was a Christian. And she said, I went and got, would get my grandmother's Methodist Bible. And she said, I would open it up. I, she said, every night I open it up. I mean, this, this wasn't past tense. This is like this happening right now. And she said, I open it up to Psalms 91 and I read it. Hmm. I said, so you just read it to the devil. She said, yes. And she said, and sometimes I've had to read it as many as 12 times, a dozen times before he leaves. She said, sometimes it's two times, sometimes it's three times. I've had to do it as many as a dozen times. And wow. she said, and he'll leave, and the silverware will fall and hit the floor. The pictures will fall and hit the floor. I'll go comfort the babies, get them to sleep, go pick up all the silverware, put it away, put the pictures back on the wall, and I go to bed. And she said, the next night, the same thing happens. And then That's the next incredible. night. And I sat there, Lynn, and listened to her. Renee, I'm sure you remember this. I sat yeah, there and listened right. to her. And, and, just thought, here she is, a sinner girl, number one, right. a demon-possessed girl, number two, knows the power and authority and dominion of the Word of God over the devil, right. even though she's not saved, she's not born again, she did not use the name of Jesus. No. She used her grandma's Methodist Bible because she knew from the time she was a little girl, somehow her grandma had instilled in her that that Bible is stronger than the devil. Yeah. 
that Bible has more power than the devil does. And, and you can just see the devil sitting there as she's saying, she just, as he's doing his thing in her house and the kids are screaming, you can just see her pick up her Bible and say, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty for I will say of the Lord. And here she goes, reads the whole yeah. thing. And he's still there. So she yeah. just starts again. He that dwelleth in the city. And then if he's still there, she reads it a third time. And she, and she said, no, she, she would not stop because she knew it worked. She knew how right. long it take, but well, she knew it worked. better than most right. Christians. <laughs> well, that was my next point. I, I, I'd say how many born again, spirit filled, yeah. Bible believing, hand clapping, foot yeah. stomping, glory shouting yeah. Christians today would, would See, number one, they'd, they'd run before they ever read it. Sure. <laughs> sure. But if they read that's it right. one time and it didn't work, they'd run and say, yeah. Brother Terry, that doesn't work. They'd run to the exactly. pastor and say, Pastor, that doesn't work. No, no, she knew that it would work. She just didn't know how long she'd have to stand there. Yeah. I'm amazed at it's that. It's amazing. Uh, stories like that, and, and of course, I've traveled with you for so many years and, and watched those things, and I've, and I've had the chance to see some of them. But but you do hurt for Christians who live in bondage. Yes, sir. Um, and, and yet in their lap or on their coffee table, like we talked about, or sitting around in every room, yeah. you have the word of God right. that can absolutely make a difference. And you're, and you always say that, that the word of God is truth. Jesus yes, said, absolutely. Father, thy word thy is word truth. Is truth. And you always make John the, John 17. You always make the distinction that, that truth is the only thing that can change or trump something that's true. That's right. right. So it may be true the devil's picking on you. It may be true that you've been presented with some diagnosis or prognosis or that exactly you've been right. presented some sort of ultimatum. But the truth it of the matter... It may be true the babies are screaming. It may be true the pictures are floating. That all may be true. But the truth is, is if you take Psalm 91 yeah, but you and you begin truth. to say of the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge. That's he good. is my Lord. You know, who do you say Jesus is? Yeah. Who is he? And as she began to say that... The devil had no choice but leave. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine the devil thinking, maybe she'll shut up this time. I'll stay a little longer. Oh, no, she started again. That's oh, no, she right. started again. Maybe she'll get That's tired. Right. Yeah, and finally he just says, I'm out of here. I mean, she's yeah. going to use that on me. I'm leaving. Dad, you've got lots of stories like this, and certainly in your old original book, More Than Conquerors, you talk about some, and and, and a lot of people know you from the hitchhiker story. Sure. And the guy shot at sure. you five times, and you talk about that in More Than Conquerors. And and for this podcast, the podcast week that, that we air this, we want to offer that book. And as a matter of fact, for everybody that goes in and likes our Terry Mize Ministries Facebook page, um, we want to give that book away to the first uh, the first twenty people that do it, and see if those people can latch onto the things of God, understand the authority that they have, understand what saying of the Lord can do for them. Absolutely. And so you can go to terrymize.com. You can find out about all of our other resources there as well. You can always go there and find out new things, blogs podcasts, all those sorts of things. So if you're interested in these things that, that will put you over the top, Absolutely. things that will make a difference. That's what, that's what this is all about is how, right. how you can live victorious on planet earth. Everybody's living on planet earth, but it's right. what, what level of victory are you living in or what level right. of defeat? And the word, the words there to put you over the words that you can take to the bank. Right. And I'm happy to give that book, you know, the brother Copeland, Kenneth Copeland wrote the forward to the book and, and it's an old book and yeah. you would think it would die by now. But you know, it just never dies. People just keep keep hearing it and keep hearing it and keep hearing those stories and keep using it. And so, uh, yeah, we're delighted to do that. Right. Well, that's good. And 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 real quick, uh, one of the things that we're that we're talking to some people around the around the world about these ministers and leaders that we bring in from all over the place and we minister to them. Uh, one of the things we talk to them about is authority and how you Absolutely. say of the Lord and Absolutely. what you do. And we're about to go do that. We're gearing up for a trip in Romania. Sure. Um, and we've got it scheduled right now for October right. where we're going to bring uh, right. pastors and leaders from all over the nation of Romania right. in. And so talk to us a well, little bit will, about... All right, these will be gypsy pastors. Actually, okay. Renee and I were just there in February and, and did this. And uh, we're, we're looking to go back again in, in October and uh, bring in these gypsy pastors from all over the country, all over the nation. There's 4 million gypsies mm -hmm. in Romania. And there's gypsies all over the world, but there's 4 million gypsies in Romania. Most people don't even know that they have a king, but the king of the gypsies lives in Romania. And uh, in fact, a lot of gypsies that live in the United States and other places around the, around the, uh, the world, uh, the, they have one king, and they don't all recognize him, don't all accept him, but, but the king of the gypsies actually lives in Romania. Yeah. And uh, the one that just passed away is a friend of mine. Used mm -hmm. to come to, you That's met right. him, uh, he used to come to my meetings because he was impressed with the miracles and the things that God had done. But anyway, um, uh, we, we just, uh, like I said, Renee and I just came back from there, had a had hundred gypsy pastors and their wives, and then we're headed back again to train them. And since we've been ministering to them for several decades, I think, I think we figured up Renee been 18 years 18 or something years. we've been ministering to them and since we've been ministering to them 
they've had tremendous revival, which they trace back to us coming and doing yeah, they, our, our. They say our, that. We they don't say, say that. that. That's right. They've had tremendous revival, and they've built over four hundred churches. That's incredible. Four hundred yeah. churches that are that are that are not only talking about the things of God, but are talking about authority oh, and are talking about some of the things that, that we've been able to take time and really impart to them. Like you said, over 18 years, this isn't a, Hey, Hey, you know, one hour meeting oh, no, where no, we no. throw something out there. This is Long this is lots and lots of time. What were you going to say? Renee? Well, just the, you know, back to Psalm 91 of the confessing the word of God that I, I, I really feel like much of the church around the world is still recovering from the dark ages and mm-hmm. their approach to the word of God. When they treat it like, I can, I'll just touch it, or I'll just hold it, or just owning one makes my life better. In yeah. that regard, right. uh, well, that's a start. But if you don't take it and put it in your heart and in your mouth, which is what, you know, scripturally Romans 10 tells us, that, that you're born again by believing in the heart and saying out of the mouth. Absolutely. Well, it's the same thing. My relationship has to become valid in that way by putting the word of God in my heart and in my mouth. So what the enemy wants to do always is make you think that you that saying it is not important yeah. and make you think that not thinking about it. In other words, God wants you just to devour it, and that's how our whole relationship Absolutely. with yeah. him is. And the reason they've had so much revival with the, the gypsy uh, population there in Romania through the years, one of the reasons has been is because the constant and cons- uh, you know consistent uh, teaching that that Terry and and uh, Terry Maris have gone in there and done, and they have yeah. just taught them on the Word of God that it's their responsibility. It's not just a religious attachment to yeah. a philosophy, right? Which is what makes Christianity so distinctively different is that it's built on the autonomy of one person that'll believe it in their heart, say it in their mouth, renew their mind to it, speak something out, and command an authority, right? That disease go, oppression leave, governments change, all of these things. It begins to bring about a mindset of authority rather than just, you know, a feeble, well, I hope God works it out. Well, I'm a hoping and a praying. It it moves you out of a religion into a relationship of authority and power because of our position that we are kings and priests. We're sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Father God, the Creator, and His indwelling presence in the earth in us is by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So it's all of that all put back together in Psalm 91 and giving me the authority. And that, that first verse there talks about the he who. Well, that's almost like whosoever will. He right. who. He who. Well, are you a he who? Right. <laughs> we'll do I, that. I am a and he then, who. And then the next verse, then, then if you are, then I'm going to say something. Right. If you're one of those kind of people, then you're going to have to have something to say. That's and right. here's what you say. And if you become one of those people and you do say those things, okay. then if you go on down to the end of the chapter, God tells us what he'll do. And that involves right. all sorts of blessings and things that, and that's that the he'll part do we for were us. Talking to the grandson. That's the reward. Yeah, we were talking to the grandsons and, and saying, you know, uh, because you have set your love upon me, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, Lord, because I've set my love upon you, then you're going to be with me and give me long life yeah. and deliver me out of trouble. And that's the confession side yeah, of the word of God, God speaking it. Yeah, that's so good. Well, and that's the difference, that's the difference in just reading it or touching it or having it in the house or actually getting it in Inside you and right. declaring right. it, you oh, know, yeah. it goes back to Brother Osteen. You know, Joel's Joel Osteen's daddy, Brother John Osteen, who was our pastor. You know, Dean Renee and and and, Jack, and used to be on staff there when we first met back in the seventies. And then Mom and I would come in from from Mexico. You know, and Brother Osteen, and he had always started every service by having everybody hold their Bible up and say, "This is my Bible," and have them say that, "This is my Bible." I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. And he had those people repeat that thousands and thousands and thousands. Right. Lakewood still does it. Joel still does it. You know, this is my Bible. This is my yeah, Bible. Not just right. this is the Bible. No, it's my Bible. got my name on it's it. Exactly. It's written to me, for there's, me, from my God. There's ownership. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. But the other side of that is if you don't know who it says you are, then you don't know who you are. No. If you don't know what it says you can have, you don't know what you can have. If you don't know what it says you can do, you don't know what you can do. And if you don't know what you can do or what you can have or who you are, then you're subject to attack. Yeah. Because you don't have any well, ammunition. You're subject to doing what the world says you're supposed yeah. to do. And somebody yeah. else will decide that for you. Well, and really, we've just scratched the surface of this. But I feel like this stuff is 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 Word of God 101. And we sure. absolutely have to get a hold of it. And, of course, lots of stuff that we talk about 
deals with these sorts of things. This is the stuff that we want the Christians in the world to get a hold of so that they can make a difference. And so they're not, they don't run around feeling like they have targets on their head. And of course, lots of our resources talk about this on terrymize.com. Of course, you can find all that stuff there. You can find out about our upcoming trip to India. You can talk, uh, find out about our upcoming trip to Romania, which we just talked about. Get involved in that. We love our partners and always need partners to come get involved with us. And, uh, and so anyway, we're going to talk more about this kind of stuff on our, on podcasts to come. And, uh, Absolutely. we appreciate you being well, here and why, listening. That's and, why I agreed to do these podcasts because this, this kind of stuff is what we cut our teeth on. And this is what will put you over. You, yeah. You can take this to the bank. That's good. Well, praise God. Thank you. And, uh, stay tuned. If you want to, if you want to, uh, find out more about us, go to terrymize.com and, uh, we will uh, be doing these podcasts regularly and look forward to being with you again. You've been listening to a Mize Missions podcast. For all the latest updates to our global projects, speaking engagements, and social media, visit us at terrymize.com. You can partner with us to give living bread to dying men around the world. Get involved at terrymize.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This has been a presentation of Terry Mize Ministries.